Hi everyone, Charles from The Food People here. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. And it's my great pleasure to welcome John Davies, MD of Levy UK and Ireland, leading sports and leisure caterer and part of Compass Group, who you all know best for catering at uh, hospitality, catering and hospitality at some of the UK's premier venues, including the O2 Arena, Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, Twickenham and the All England Tennis Club at Wimbledon. John is here today to talk about why sustainability and food wealth are, are essential to the sector's long term recovery in the COVID era. Welcome, John, and thank you very much for joining me today as part of the Food People in conversation with. Hi, Charles. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And I'm delighted to be here. It's a pleasure. At The Food People, we're very clear about why we do what we do. We're champions of change driven every day by our intent to shift the future of food and drink by harnessing the power of trends. And this In Conversation With series is all about talking to other people, businesses, brands and entrepreneurs to find out more about why they do what they do and how in their way they're championing change and shifting the future of food and drink. So, John, great to be speaking to you today. I mean, the last six months have had a massive impact not only on hospitality and restaurants, but also sporting events and the music business and therefore your business. So how is the state of play now and um, how have things been and, and, and where are you where are you up to? Uh, yeah, I think it's obviously been a very challenging year, Charles. I mean, we 2020, I think, will go down in everyone's careers as, as probably the most challenging. I can't see too many years. Um, you know, when I look back at the end of my career being as challenging as this one, we, we went through the 2008 financial crisis and, and felt the after effects of that uh, in the hospitality events business. And that definitely, it was a struggle for a couple of years afterwards, certainly in terms of conference and events uh, and a little bit on hospitality spend. Um, but this is, is really unprecedented in, in its level of severity. Um, the last major event we carried out as a business was Cheltenham Festival back in March, uh, which feels like a, a lifetime ago. Um, we'd have normally been doing a very busy summer, summer events uh, from, from you know, the, you know, Wimbledon tennis through to uh, cricket test matches at the like of, the likes of Edgbaston and the Oval. Obviously a busy, busy schedule at Ota Arena, Wembley Arena. Um, as well as the end of the football season and indeed the start of a new football season. So we, we've actually we've actually missed both now. So it's been hugely disruptive, um, hugely impactful on teams, very, you know, that, and that's where you start with uh, the people, the people at the front line have been have, have had the heaviest impact. Um, and it's been a real struggle to, to see through this. We did start to see some light at the end of the tunnel through some pilot events and test events. In the summer, um, we, we, we carried out a number of COVID safe uh, pilot events, if you like. Um, and that, and that, then they were received well, obviously vastly reduced capacities at the likes of the Oval and Edgebaston. We, we did a rugby test event at Harlequins um, and everything was going well. We had one planned at Goodwood uh, for one of the race days and that was pulled 24 hours before the event was due to go ahead, which was, which was a real, you know, a real kick in the teeth, I'll be honest, for, for, for the client, for ourselves, and mostly for the team down there who, who worked, you know, 24-7 for two weeks to try and get that event away. Yeah. And really now we're in, we're in a period of obviously just trying to batten down the hatches um, and make sure that we keep as many good people as we can still within the business um, and, and look to early 2021 in reality um, to, to see any scale of major events return. Yeah. And what in reality does that mean uh, you know, to keep as many good people within the business? Because if you if you effectively if you're not running events, how, how does that yeah how does that manifest itself? Well, uh, look, you get to the point where if you cut too hard, um, that there will simply be not not be the skill set, the operational knowledge left in the business to relife it to remobilize the business. Because that's effectively what we're looking at: remobilizing an entire business from scratch. Yeah. that will have been mothballed for almost a year when we get around to it. Yeah. Um, so we have to keep as many people as we can, general managers, hospitality managers, retail, head chefs in the business. Now, we've done that through through a lot of redeployment. You know, we're lucky in a way in Compass that we are we, we have six major segments yeah. and of those six major segments, um, you know, I'm fully closed down, but obviously we still have um, busy operations in healthcare, in education, uh, in defence. Um, we've also, you know, been trying to, to help wherever we can 
across uh, you know across the crisis so very early early on in the crisis all our variable staff we try to redirect into our healthcare operations to support um, the NHS trusts where we provide catering and and porterage and, and support services um, and, and at that time if you think around Easter and beyond that was right at the peak of the crisis so there was a lot of um, self-isolation going on within our staff there was a lot of demand because you've gone from maybe a single shift pattern to a three shift pattern hospitals open 24 7. so we were, we were able to provide a lot of work um, to people looking into other sectors and, and doing things like having testing centers running in at some of our venues has enabled our teams to, to remain employed so taking full use of the furlough scheme for those people um, that have you know have the opportunity to work going forward and we see them as vital to our business uh, and just keep us I suppose entrepreneurial and dynamic as possible um, so that we that we keep ourselves you know uh, relevant to the business going forward and that re that um, relaunch as it were when that comes that remobilization in you know, early early next year I mean that must be quite a feat in itself I mean closing down I guess is one thing but then having the, the the people and the belief in the demands to be able to spin that back up again is I would imagine probably even more complex than than the close down I don't know what, what your thoughts on that yeah I mean I'd, I'd be lying if I you know if we said that we think it's going to be easy it's, it's certainly not going to be easy we're going to have less resources and left less infrastructure than previously just because mm -hmm. of the nature of the crisis and what we've had to react to so uh, look at it it will, it will very likely be a staggered restart. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to go from zero people in stadiums or events to 100% occupancy. occupancy. It's, going to, it's going to be a period, you know, whether it's before Christmas or after Christmas, where we go back to the idea of it being 20%, 30% capacities to start with, deliver those in a COVID safe way, and then maybe we go to 50, 60, 70% and beyond. So it, it will be a, a phased remobilization. Of, of those venues we we are the biggest um you know contract caterer uh, both in the uk and the world so we have access to the to the biggest resource pool it's about pooling resources keeping you know keeping that knowledge base in the business but being very flexible and dynamic and i think that's that they're the watchwords of how we how we come back it's not going to be you know this is my venue i sit in a silo you know we have to break all the silos down we have to view ourselves as one business supporting each other and the only way we come back is if we have a common purpose and a common vision of how we get there. And I feel in Levy, we have a very, you know, it's an easy thing to say we have a family culture, but generally we do. I think we, we, all, we all know where we're going. We have a vision and a purpose. We, 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 we have great pride in what we do. And I know everyone in the Levy team is, is you know, chomping at the bit to get back into events and deliver hospitality. Um, and I know we'll get through it. It's just going to be a big challenge. Yeah, uh, that's that's great. And thanks for sh sharing that um, context. But you, it's a lovely segue, actually. And you mentioned the, the Levy um, purpose and the vision. Can I ask you, would you be prepared to share that with us? We'd love to hear more about that, if that's possible. Yeah, look, I, I've, been in, um, I've been in hospitality or food now for 20 years. Um, and I, I started, you know, when I very, very first started, I was, I was in university and working as a chef as kind of like a secondary job to pay off my student debts. And that was really the first time I got involved in food. And I've seen the whole, the whole industry change over that 20 years. I've seen food, the food on the high street, in restaurants, the whole British cultural scene change. Um, but, but I've become a, very interested in the last two or three years around the food system itself about what food we eat, why we eat it, the seasonality of produce, um, the connection between industries and, and, and companies like myself with the actual producers and growers, the whole carbon footprint of, 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 of the industry and the impact it has on climate change as a proportion to other factors is really staggering when you, when you do the research and you look into the facts and figures. And that's led me to sort of marry up the, the Levy vision into, into you know, to a real clarity of purpose. One is, in terms of in terms of what we deliver, food on the plate and the customer service we deliver, don't do anything that you're not proud of. I mean, that's as simple as that, really. We, we offer many different varieties of food, whether it's public concourse to the finest hospitality that you might get at, at the likes of a Wimbledon or Tottenham Hotspur, 
to, to, to you know, you know, very informal, casual dining that you might get at one of our smaller race courses. But the principle remains the same. Don't serve it if you're not proud of it and don't serve it in a way that you wouldn't be proud of. And, and, that, and that pride is, is what we've instilled over the last couple of years. But we've got to back that up by doing it in a way um, you know, that, that's, that's good for us as a business, i.e., you know, it's healthy for us, but it's got to, it's got to reflect that it's going to be healthy for the planet and care for the planet going forward. And, and we, we see it as a really uh, a two or three pronged strategy of, of what's good for us should be good for the planet and good for our people. Uh, and to try and get those, those three things aligned, you can only do it if you, if you have a real um, focus on, on what, what is the right way to serve food and source food uh, and treat your people going forward. Because they're all aligned, I believe, um, if in, in a good business and how we grow back out of this, this crisis is you've got to stay true to those principles. You've got to be proud to talk about them. And you've got to engage both people that work for us and, and crucially our clients and customers that we're fully aligned as, as to what the future can be. And, and how does that manifest itself in, in, in what I guess you do every day in your kind of your menu development, your sourcing, your, your pitching? How, how yeah. does that run through everything that, that, you, that you do? Well, first of all, if I was going to go into this space, I wanted to be really clear that, that I actually believed it myself, that I walk the walk. I don't just talk about it. So it, it's, I made the decision three years ago to stop eating meat, not because I don't like meat, not because um, I think, uh, you know, it, it, I'm put off by animal flesh, but because uh, having read the stats and understood the impact, um, we cannot carry on eating the volume of animal protein that we do as a Western culture and still expect to have a planet here in 30 years time that looks and feels the same. Yeah. I, I, you know, I changed the way I drive. I've changed the type of car I drive. I changed the, you know, personally, how, how I, you know, source my own electricity and energy at home. And by that, it, it, it then you read more, you, you, you get more interested in it. And then you, you, you think, oh, why are people in the business making the decisions they're making? And usually nine times out of 10, it's just because of lack of knowledge or simply having to be, you know, a little bit more education as to where the product's coming from and, and, and the impact it has. I don't think anyone's willfully writing menus or creating hospitality experiences to be to have a larger carbon footprint than they should have or to have an impact on animal welfare. Um, you know, the, the, it's just it's it's a level of convenience culture that we we've, we've ended up in that everything's available to anyone at any given time that has led us to a point where we stop thinking about it. And, and I think that's the dangerous bit. So what we've tried to instill in Levy is a re-education, if you like, about where food comes from and why it's important. To the point where simple things, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, where chefs, it would have been second nature to know what was in season, what fruit, what vegetables, even, even what game, for example, would be cheap and efficient to buy at that period, and also crucially taste nice. And similarly around animal welfare, it's, it's digging under the skin of, of what actually happens in food production to understand, okay, if we can't, if we can't afford organic or free range, which in chicken, sometimes you can't, it's not, it's not the price point that you can achieve for that customer. Okay, we'll look at stocking density for barn rear chicken. There's, it's a multifaceted faceted, um, decision-making process. Barn, barn rear chicken, for example, in this example, isn't one size fits all. You can, you can go from a very, um, you know, intensively reared broiler uh, in very poor conditions to, you know, one that, that one that has a little bit more space, enrichment, a different diet, a longer, uh, you know, a longer, a slower growing breed that has a completely different impact, both the animal welfare and, and the carbon impact. And those are the kind of things that we are opening a discussion about in Levy with our chefs, with our partners, with our with our customers. And we're not perfect. I mean, that's I don't ever claim to be perfect. We're not. We're, we're at the start of the journey. We haven't completed it. We haven't got every single ingredient and sourcing credential 100 percent right. But the intent is to continually evolve and to continually improve and to make sure that actually when you talk to our chefs, they get passionate about using British produce in season to showcase the flavours that they should be passionate about. That, as I said, that was second nature um, 30, 40 years ago, but we seem to have lost as the generation has gone on. And, and I, I get the, the sense that obviously you're really impassion you're passionate 
about that and, and you're, you're engaging your teams around this discussion, how does that conversation get down to uh, somebody going to a football match or a rugby stadium? I mean, yeah, look, it's a difficult, I mean, look, there's two different questions there because sustainability isn't necessarily hand in hand with health and well-being and health and well-being. Look, people come to major events as a treat. We have to remember that, you know, that we, we don't want to be sanctimonious. We don't want to force people to eat healthily if they don't wish to. Um, yeah. You can you can have a highly sustainable food product that is also very unhealthy. They're, yeah. <laughs> they're, not, yeah. they're, not, they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. But what we try and do is, is, you know, it's very. If you if you don't tell people it's healthy, it's just embedded in the DNA of how we produce the food. Then I think that's that's a that, that's an easy way to get through it. It, it and it involves things like you know, it's a method of cooking. You know, simple simple example. If it doesn't need to be deep fried, don't deep fry it. You know, it's yeah. a you know, can, can can we bake it? Can we can we grill it? Um, and embed that as a as that's the go-to only deep fry if you absolutely have to. It's the level of saturated fats as well as the the freshness of the ingredient that becomes, you know, ultimately important to us. We're a fresh food company. We don't we don't regenerate food. We don't buy processed food. That's not you know that's not what we're about as a hospitality business. So if you're starting from a fresh ingredient, cooking it from scratch, using a cooking method that is is healthier than some. Um, you will inevitably end up with a healthier meal than than is potentially yeah. possible. But it's also understanding that look, a football fan does want a pie or a burger or a hot dog. You can't yeah. ban those products. Yeah. You offer a, re- a bigger range and choice. You know, we opened a vegan kiosk at Chelsea um, in January this year, and it was very well received. Yeah. In the sense that we need to start just enhancing the product range to see if people will switch rather than force people down that down that line. Uh, in the same way that. Rugby is a good example. You can't take red meat off the menu at rugby. You know, it's it's ingrained in the culture that that it's a it's a beef or lamb culture that exists at, in hospitality there, and that's that that can be challenged, but it's a process and an evolution. You start with the portion size, you know, and that's when I talk about plant forward. It's about yes, you can have meat on the plate, but we should be looking at the gram size. It doesn't need to be 500 grams of beef or lamb and a very small proportion of, of vegetables or potatoes. How do we rebalance that menu so it's more of a balanced, balanced plate approach um, to show that, that, and most people, when you, when, you, when you show that and you get the textures and you get the flavors and you get the colors, they're, they're really in tune to it. And you just have to be clever in how you position the animal product. If you go down the, the view that, it's, that it is a steak or a rump, it's very hard then to move away from that. It's about then using the meat as a garnish or a smaller portion as an overall more complex meal, which you see very much on the high street at the moment, very much in modern cooking, very much with modern chefs and recipes coming out. We just need to reflect that vision into our hospitality menus going forward. But when we ask our customers, uh, actually, you know, what, what has been perceived as value in the past, i.e. it's a high ticket hospitality item, therefore it needs to be a, a T-bone steak, a ribeye steak, a, lo- a loin of lamb, Actually, it makes people at lunchtime especially feel quite heavy, quite bloated and, and quite sleepy by the time they get to the event or watching the game. And that's not what they're going to have the experience for. They want delicious food. But equally, when we put a really good fish dish on, it tends to be one of the most popular options that we'll put on. So it's having that bravery to put lighter dishes on, even for a rugby crowd. And, and actually, you'll get, you'll get good buy-in. You know, it's, it's, it's just being that flexibility um, and to challenge what's perceived as the norm. Yeah, and and do your, do your chefs get equally excited about you know the possibilities with um, protein versus uh, vegetables? And I only ask this because many chefs have talked to us about that before. About you know there are certain things, certain rules, certain um, uh, guardrails of what you can do with a chicken breast, but actually a cauliflower or that's there's a real freedom with that, and there there aren't those preconceived rules and guardrails when it comes to vegetables i don't know what your views yeah. are on that no I, I, quite right charles i mean ultimately if you're a highly trained passionate chef that lives and breathes food and you're given a you know a steak to cook there's only so many ways you can cook a steak well in fact there's there's only one real way you can cook a steak i.e on a char grill for a small amount of time there's no real 
skill level that you're adding to that steak, you're just you're just taking an item and processing it in, a, in the quickest way possible. I think when you take a like cauliflower, or well, any brassica is a good example where you can create something that's visually very appealing. They can come in all shapes and sizes, all shapes and colors. The colors that you get from her heritage vegetables now are really, really exciting. And we've got chefs in our business, you know, our, our, exec, our exec chef down at Twickenham um, who, who, who went vegan himself, you know, suddenly gets really passionate about how do I pickle? How do I preserve? How do I roast? You know, how do I, how do I get away from the traditional methods of cooking? And, and getting the flavor uh, combinations right in a vegetable dish are far more challenging um, than, than, than just taking a piece of animal protein. And I think if you get chefs engaged in it, they get, they get really excited about the opportunities because the, 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 the textures and the visual combinations that you can achieve, I think are, are fantastic. And just going back to the previous area of the conversation around um, uh, sustainability, um, and are you managing to take that conversation right down to a, a, con a consumer level? So somebody working in a, uh, in a kiosk is able to have that you know conversation with somebody buying a product around um you know the the sourcing and the, the sustainability conversation is that incorporated to pos and those types of things yet uh yeah look in in, in certain examples it is again we're not perfect not certainly not in every case would that would that be true um as i said before we where we've launched specific products or specific offers at the likes of um at chelsea another example was at wimbledon last year where we we took the whole chicken um, from from a company well Sutton Hoo Chicken, which is a, a free range chicken a grower producer, excellent producer um, up at Sutton Hoo. We were buying the whole bird, um, serving the breast um, in hospitality, and then taking the wings and the thighs to serve on the retail. So in that example, the the yes, it was on all the POS. Yes, it was on the menus that you, you, we were using full carcass usage. This was a, from a free range. Uh, broiler, it come from, um, you know, East Anglia, and the people that were in the unit were very passionate about it, it was on their, it was on their uniforms, it, we had good, we good, good uh, visual display as to what the, what that, what that meant, and that tied in very well with Wimbledon's ethos, which is tennis, tennis in an English garden, um, and, and it really brings it all together, so it's a cohesive story for the customer that's coming there, and, and why they, why they'd be interested in that, and, and look, whenever we put it in our menus, and you know, conference and events is a good example. You know, a lot of our stadiums are only used 20 to 30 times a year for match days. So we've got we've got the vast majority of the year available for, for conferences and events where we launched last year uh, Mindful Meetings, which was about doing um, uh, those kind of catering at those kind of events, whether it was a, a company launch, a company conference um, or an exhibition where you were delivering um, food that was actually healthier for you and actually gave you more energy and, and our sales teams our teams that were delivering that food were really passionate about it and they could talk about it they could engage with customers they could engage with the client um, who was coming for that meeting to upsell them that package and explain the reasons why it would be beneficial for that meeting so yes in short you do need everyone engaged and you do need everyone um, clear on, on why we're doing this and, and it's it's multifaceted um, but it's positive out, outcomes for everyone involved. In, in terms of the broader sector, how, how, how different is your kind of perspective on, on, on this particular uh, area and, the, and this, this topic versus the norm within the, the, um, the sector? And I guess why, you know, why, why now? Why in this, this, this moment is it um, a, a priority? Uh, but look, I can't speak for others in the sector. I think everyone's, uh, I think everyone's got an agenda around sustainability and sourcing. I think all clients are interested, um, some more than others. Uh, depends on the focus of the organisation. Um, I think you, the reason I do it is because I believe it's the best way to do it. I think it sets us apart, um, and, and, it, and it's the right way to show leadership in the industry at the moment. Um, if everyone, if it, if it gives us a competitive edge, then great, but that's not necessarily the reason I'm doing it. I think we are only gonna get out of this particular crisis, i.e. COVID, if we, if we do it with the right intent and the right purpose. But more importantly, we just, you know, say if, say if COVID went away next month because mass vaccination happened, we're still back to square one on, on facing the biggest challenge that humanity's got, which is how do we get back to 
um, or how do we keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees of pre-industrial warming, which let's face it, most people think we're already beyond being able to keep it to 1.5. We're, we're looking at two degrees of warming. How, how and, and as an industry, we have a big part to play in that. Forget about it being leave your compass. As an industry as a whole, if you take agriculture and all the aspects of hospitality, you know, any, any estimates could be between 20 and 50% of global emissions come from, from all of those areas that we touch, including food waste. Yeah. And, and if we show uh, leadership of how you can do it in a sustainable way, and, and you can still grow and you can still be successful, you can still keep people employed, you can still treat people fairly, but yet we can do it in a way that, that secures a future for my children and their children, that has to be, it was the only version. And in my head, we can either do it now, as in 2020, or we could be forced to do it in 2050 uh, when the world is literally falling around our ears at that yeah. point. Um, and I'd much rather be proactive and, and take the change. And the change is simple. It's, we have to eat a more balanced plate. We have to eat less animal products. Uh, we have to be less reliant on monocrops. We have to have a, a diet much more balanced with, with seeds and nuts and whole grains. And we need to eat a hell of a lot more fresh fruit and vegetables, but they have to be sourced crucially from an area that is relatively local to us, yeah. i.e. not being certainly not being flown across the world. And, and as much as possible, we limit um, imports and exports of, of those products. And I think the post-COVID world tells us that we need to be more connected with local communities, tells us we need a supply chain that we can trust more, that we know where it's come from, and that in a time of crisis, we can feed ourselves because ultimately that that is the challenge how on earth do we manage to feed ourselves in in 20 30 years time and there'll be probably by estimates probably another two billion people on this planet so we'll get to about 90 billion people by 2050 um with with temperatures rising we'll have crop failure um we'll have mass dispersal of people um, because of global warming we'll have you know coral reefs completely dying off so 25 percent of sea life um, either dead or dormant, as well as the, the, the fish and the fish and the marine life we've already decimated through dredging. So there, there simply won't be the land available at those temperatures to graze livestock in the way we are now, or indeed to grow. You know, crazy. You know, we've got a crazily inefficient food system. You know, we, we use most of our land to grow crops, to feed animals, to feed ourselves. Yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. it it doesn't logically when you step back from it, it makes no logical sense. Um, and we cannot survive as a species if we continue in that in that mindset. And if we just continue to put our head in the sand and think, well, it's not up to me to change it. It's not, you know, someone will work it out. We'll come up with some moonshot technology that takes all the carbon out of the atmosphere and we can just carry on as we are. You know, it's, it's not reality. No. And, and I'm not a doom and gloom merchant. I am optimistic, but you have to be optimistic about the change and you have to be prepared to step into that and say, as a business, I'm prepared to try and make this work commercially and also in a way that is good for the planet. It's not easy, you, you know, you can't, there's no, there's no, no magic bullet uh, that makes it all work from day one, but I'm absolutely 100% convinced that unless more companies take that view, we aren't gonna have a future, simple as that. Do you have a sense of the level of impact that um, Lever UK and Ireland could have in the context of the bigger picture have you have you kind of done you've done that math and said this is this is what we if we do this this is the kind of impact that we could have we're, we're the world's largest caterer with a with levy of the, the world's um well, one of the world's largest sports caterer because we have a big operation over in the us but in terms of what we're doing in the uk yet yeah, we're the market leader you know we we have by volume and by number of sites the the, the biggest footprint so if we can show that it can work and we can do it in the right way, I think it does have a big impact on the overall industry and it does have a big voice, voice uh, out to, to other companies and other clients that, that we can do this sustainably and fairly. Um, I wouldn't want to overblow our influence. Clearly, there are many different uh, other companies with different strategies and different approaches. And not, I'm not saying it's 100% uh, correct in, in what I'm saying in terms of this is the only way to do it. But if, if every company has the right intent that, that feels and looks the same way, then I think we can come together and, and try and make a change. And, and definitely in this crisis, we've, we have talked to other companies, um, either other providers, other hospitality companies, just about the crisis. There's been more interaction, there's been more forums, there's been more groups. 
And I think that there is starting to be a commonality of thinking about how we go forward. And indeed, we've been making partnerships with other companies that are like minded. You know, we, we, we've got an official partnership now with Curb, the original um, street food. Right. Um, right. Um, you know, and Simon and Petra, the fat Simon who's the CEO and Petra, the founder, um, very passionate about the same issues that I am. Uh, and it just shows that if you can start and we started those conversations literally may have been just before 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 lockdown but certainly accelerated in the period of lockdown to say okay how do we jointly support each other we're like-minded we've got the same approach we could we could have a really good relationship where you can bring your traders your passion into our events to our to our venues and really add value but do it in a way that's completely aligned around the issues that i've spoken about that sounds that sounds like a really exciting collaboration is there any more that you can say on that where you when you i guess a lot will depend on legislation and when venues are allowed to open up that sounds yeah. really really exciting well look we're, we're planning you know what what hopefully we can say touch wood and <laughs> we'll touch wood is that hopefully by summer next year you know events and venues are back open um and, and a trading as normally as possible so we're planning now with Simon and the team, you know, what does, what does spring look like? What does summer look like? We plan, we plan major events, you know, 12 months in advance anyway. So there's some really good conversations already happening. Um, some of their traders are really excited about being involved in some of the venues and high, high level events that we operate at. And I think there's, there's definitely multiple areas that we can, we can collaborate on and not just in London because Curb essentially is, it, Curb has its, has its own social purpose. They're very passionate about incubating businesses yeah. and there's no reason why we can't look at other areas of the UK and go and, you know, not, not take London traders or London knowledge to those areas, but actually incubate the talent that already exists in those other cities yeah. and grow it under the curb and backed by Levy and the venues that we have. I think there's a really exciting, um, you know, joining of, of minds there that can create a new vision on both, both outdoor events in terms of street food outside of the venues at, at some of our at some of our greenfield events as well as you know I, i'm perfectly open about bringing curb traders inside our venues you know yeah. i see ourselves we, we, we should be an incubator of talent in that way as well we should be opening up our venues in collaboration with the client to say look if there's a really good local operator with a real passion they have created, and, and usually what happens with street food is they've created a mono product that's of an exceptionally high quality, that is authentic, that is genuine. And, and our customers can tell the difference between when we've created something that's, that says it's street food and real street food. There is a difference. And it's taken me 20 years to maybe give up the ghost and say, you know what, sometimes you have to get the authentic providers involved to be able to deliver it. And if that, if, and if that could be... In, a, in an entry level hospitality environment where you know there's a lot of entry level hospitality where it is more cash food it's access to a bar it's a more casual lounge why can't there be a curb street food trader in that environment why can't there be a curb street food trader on a public concourse of yeah. course can. you know we just have to be more open-minded about our business model and, and how we make this thing work commercially um, but ultimately if we give the, the the fan or the consumer what they want which is a great product at the right price we should be pretty flexible about the route to market do you do you think the and i would probably think about it more as the the covid era as opposed to lockdowns i think this you know this is going to be um an influence in our world for some time to come in some form do you think that it that what you're doing with curb there as an example is just even more relevant in this era yeah i mean look uh, it's too early to say what what events in the future looks like in, in, in a world where people feel, I mean, I think people need to feel safe to come out again to major events and they need to yeah. feel that, the, and that could be achieved through mass testing, you know, instant testing results, lateral flow, or it could be achieved through vaccination program, or it could be achieved because levels and incidents of cases have just, yeah. just held off completely as we get, get into next year. Um, but once that's achieved, I think there is a huge pent up demand still to get out into live entertainment, into live sport, into big conferences and exhibitions, because we've been doing well, exactly what we're doing uh, for the last seven or eight months, which is talk virtually, um, you know, on, on a screen. And we're, we humans are social animals. We, we are born to interact. We're born to go out uh, and, and, to, and to express ourselves. 
to, to be part of a tribe, whatever tribe that is, whether that's a football club that you support, like, like Everton for myself, um, or, or it's, a, it's an industry that you're, you feel connected to and you're going to that, that, that exhibition or that convention, that will still exist. Yeah. And, I, and I think it will exist you know, in, a, in a stronger format because working from home or virtual home working, I think if some level is going to happen and continue to happen in the future. So connecting on a, on a regular basis, whether it's your, your fellow colleagues, um, whether it's companies getting together to talk as a team, or whether it's uh, friends and family getting together on a hospitality format, I think there'll be a huge demand for that. And um, we've talked about this, I guess, on and off uh, as we've been discussing, but I wanted to ask you specifically about uh, perhaps outside of some of the territories that we've discussed, where you perhaps individually, but also as Levy see some of the, um, the challenges and opportunities as we move um, you know, further into the, um, the, the near future we, we don't, you know, I think this has been a bit of a wake up call for us. You know, we, we've had unparalleled growth as an industry, not just Levy. I think all, all hospitality, both on the high street, um, in, in major events, in sports, we've had a decade of, of growth and success. And, and you can get a little bit complacent. You assume that every year you're going to add 3%, 4%, 5%, whatever your metric is as a business. Yeah. And this is a wake up call to say, well, that isn't just going to be the norm going forward. We're going to have to be dynamic and entrepreneurial as a business. And as a large, you know, we are a large corporate. We're a multinational company. We're in the FTSE 100. So for us to be flexible and dynamic is a challenge. You know, it's, it's usually very small businesses with a small ownership group that have that ability. So that's why we, you know, certainly in Levy, we're going down a model where we can have partnerships with, with smaller entrepreneurial com companies so we can react quicker and we can deliver a service that, that, that perhaps we didn't envisage, yeah. you know, six months ago. And as I sit here in October 2020, I can't fully envisage what the service that I'll need to provide, say, in 24 months will be. Because we, 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 are, we are completely changing how we deliver and what we deliver on almost a, a monthly basis at the moment. We had plans in place before the crisis, for example, on technology. You know, we, we were pushing anyway into more digital era click and collect, data-driven, venue apps, better EPOS, contactless payment as, as the norm, you know, just, just, just do that. All of those conversations were in train and we, we delivered that a number of venues in 2019. All that the crisis has taught us is, well, if we were planning to do that over two years, we need to do it over now six months. Yeah. Because if we come back, technology will be a big driver in terms of customer experience. You know, all those conversations that we had Back in January or February, when I was talking to clients of would their customers download an app? Would they are they happy paying by card and they're not having cash? Are they happy engaging pre-event on what they'd like to eat and how they'd order it? Well, you can't go out now without doing all those things. I mean, that that has now been embedded it's as a the societal norm. norm, isn't it? Yeah. If if you want to eat in a restaurant, if you want even if you want to go to the pub, yeah, you have to you have to do an element of planning and registration and ordering. Yeah. Now, look, now that's embedded as a norm, let's make sure that we continue to use that in the best way possible. I make the customer experience seamless, make sure that we're delivering the product at the price and the efficiency that the customer wants and actually use the data and the systems to deliver something that perhaps we weren't doing in the past. I get through the, queue, the queues a lot more efficiently. Yeah. Make sure that if someone wants another drink or another piece of food or another meal, they have easy access to it which isn't easy sometimes at our major events where we've got 70 or 80,000 people in one venue. Yeah. So how, how, how we deliver that in the future will be partly or very, very much embedded in, in, in some of the research and foundational work we've done with IT um, in, in, in the period of this time. One kind of last question, as as Charles and as the food people, you know, we want to be known for championing change and shifting the future of food and drink. What what is it that you, as John, would want to be uh, known for? Yeah, I think for me, it's 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 really simple. I, I've got the ability. I'm lucky enough to be in a position where, um, you know, we're a big company and we have we have a degree of influence. If we can use that power and influence for the for the right way and we can change behaviours and habits in the right way without mandating them, without forcing them down people's throats. If we can create a vision of hospitality and how we deliver hospitality so it is genuinely better for the planet and better for us, 
and they are completely linked. You know, a healthy, a healthier planet equals healthier human beings. Yeah. We will live longer. We won't, we won't get sick as much, uh, and, and we will have more productive and, and, and energetic lives. And if I can help, you know, I can't fix that. You know, I'm not, you know, I certainly don't have the power to do that, but I can help do my bit to, to turn the dial. And I see, I see the food industry as an ocean liner. If we can, you know, if we can just change it a couple of degrees every year, then in 20 or 30 years time, hopefully we'll be going in a completely different direction. Yeah, I think there's a lot that we can take from Michael Pollan's uh, book and I, I loved actually the fact that you've got um, one of his quotes that I really love and we've used in many different contexts you know eat eat food not too much and mostly plants and uh, I think that there's as a it's very very simple but a huge amount we can take from from that and um, to use the sporting analogy it's a race that we've got to win isn't it mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and look uh, it, it's not about coming up with new ideas all, all ideas have already been spoken about and, and it's just about it's it's voicing the correct ideas in my view and Michael Pollan is one of those great great leaders in this field who's very passionate he's done so, you know he's written some amazing books and documentaries just what he's saying I 100% I endorse and, he, and he's been around the world and he's he's gone into various different cultures and really studied the impact of diet on the human body and what we can do and those seven simple words from that quote that's it yeah. again you don't need to go any further if you just stuck to that principle we we would get through this in a, in a in a way that it's better for us and better for the planet john that seems a fitting point on which to wrap up our, our discussion and uh and conclude this um, episode of the food people in conversation with john on behalf of us all at the food people thank you so much for sparing time in your agenda to join me today i think you've given us a a really fascinating and insightful look into how you uh, in your particular space and sector are shifting the future of food and drink it's been a real real pleasure to speak to you today so thank you for joining me no problem thank you charles so do join our tfp community for the details of our latest in conversation with episodes as well as all the latest free to access food and drink trends for site visit the foodpeople.co.uk and complete your details at the footer of the page on behalf of john and myself thanks for listening to the food people in conversation with how are you shifting the future of food and drink <laughs>